Today will be much less ranty and less physics-y, well, somewhat less physics-y. There'll be an increasing uh, amount of geometry, hopefully. So, last time I told you about what ADS-CFT is, it's a, con it's a conjectured correspondence or duality, physical equivalence between, um, on the one hand, quantum, certain quantum field theories, which are theories, as we discussed, that live on some fixed space-time and a quantum mechanical, and on the other side of the correspondence, certain quantum theories of gravity, we could call them, but really they're quantum theories where space and time is dynamic. That's what one might most generally call a gravitational theory. And, um, you know, there are conjectured specific uh, examples of this correspondence where you know what both the theories on both sides are. And there's a lot of evidence, in particular for this sort of canonical example, this n equals 4 super yang mills we talked about. There's a lot of evidence that this conjecture is true. It's still a conjecture. And as I, as I said, it's very unlikely to be proven because to prove it, you would need to know what both sides look like. And we don't, you know, understanding quantum field theory is at a rigorous proof, you know, level of proof is, is already very hard for free field theories, let alone interacting theories. So I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect this to be proven. Um, and as I said before, if you believe it's not true, I think by now you probably need to have some rather specific reason you believe it not to be true. However, that said, it's still important to stress it's, this isn't known to be fact yet. So I talked about relativistic quantum field theories, which maybe to many of you is very familiar and to many of you is a little bit alien, um, probably half and half. Um, today I'm going to tell you what a CFT is, and given what we've said before, uh, I think we can... Uh, we can go reasonably quickly. Conformal field theory is, is a huge subject. It's, it's basically a, a statement, a conformal field theory is a quantum field theory with some additional symmetries beyond relativistic invariance or the Poincare symmetry. It's a huge subject, particularly in low dimensions, and we won't, we won't be interested in low dimensions by which I mean one plus one theories where all sorts of beautiful things happen, and we'll need very little from the general story. Um, I will, so I will only say things about what we'll actually need in order to define ADS-CFT. So we'll start off by talking about CFTs, and hopefully we will also discuss ADS, which, how many of you are familiar with ADS space-time? How many of you aren't? Okay, so, so, uh, so hopefully we'll... Hopefully, we'll be able to discuss both of these things today, and then I'm hoping tomorrow I'll be able to state actually in detail how the correspondence works. We'll see. So let's just recap. Um, in the usual coordinates on Minkowski, we have uh, the Lorentz and translation symmetries of the Poincaré group. we can think of as being generated in this way. And we're going to now consider a theory that is not only invariant under those, but is also has a scale invariance. So we'll also require our QFT to have scale invariance. And scale invariance uh, is an invariance of Minkowski space-time, again, as with the Poincaré group, uh, where I just scale all my coordinates by a constant, time and space, okay? So that's a scale transformation. And um, our fields that we build our theory from, if we want our theory to have a scale invariance, we should have that the action is scale invariant, and that we should have our fields have some definite uh, transformation under this. And we require our fields to transform in the following way. 
case. So, you know, maybe there's other indices on the field that some tensor field, but let's suppress those. So, the field transforms uh, as, a, as an invariant, as a scalar quantity, up to some overall scaling, where delta is some constant associated to the field, and delta is called the scale dimension. Of phi. And remember, in, we, we've taken mass units, so we've taken h bar equals c equals 1, and we're thinking of uh, all the units being given now in terms of mass. And this is just, uh, this scale dimension, at least classically, is just the mass dimension of the field. Okay, if you have a little think about how this works. Okay, so, so classically, it's just the mass dimension. And the generator for this transformation, we call the dilatation or dilatation operator D, and it looks like this. So when I, the, the, for, a, for an infinitesimal scale transformation, the uh, infinitesimal shift in my field is governed by this acting on the field. Okay. Yep. Sorry. This is how the field transforms under this transformation. So, <laughs> lambda is a constant. Yeah, I'm, I think we're, we're butting up against physics versus uh, maths in a very fundamental and deep way. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure at this point uh, if I try, I'm not sure I can raise this to a mathematical level on the fly that's going to be useful <laughs> and correct. Okay, so um, we can think, let's see, how do I, how do I think about this? Uh, so this is some diffeomorphism, I can think of this as some diffeomorphism equivalently, and then this would be uh, this operator here under this diffeomorphism would be the Lie. I mean, this diffeomorphism is generated by some vector field, and this is the Lie derivative of this field contracted with that, that generating vector field. Okay. So, <laughs> that probably still wasn't a uh, high enough uh, level. Okay. So then, uh, together, remember we already have our generators for the Poincaré group, which are uh, the translation and Lorentz generators. And this new generator has some definite, I'm going to be, uh, well, it has some definite uh, trans, uh, you know, we can now add it to our algebra. This is now our algebra. These are all the commutation relations of the Lie algebra together with the Poincaré algebra that we would require our generators for this scale invariance to satisfy. And just something to note now, m squared, which was a Casimir of the Poincaré group, is no longer, it no longer commutes with everything, so no, no longer a Casimir. And so in particular, you can't have uh, you know, you can't, a, a field with a mass, as we're used to in relativistic field theory, no longer is a good representation under this larger Poincaré plus scale invariance group. And uh, in a scale invariant theory, all couplings in the action should be dimensionless, 
So, i.e., the, the action uh, should have no mass scales within it because obviously those mass scales won't be scale invariant. So action should have uh, mass scales in it. So a theory that's scale invariant is of this marginal type that's truly scale invariant is of this marginal type that we wrote down before. And in particular, roughly speaking, it will look the same at every scale. So it's a very special theory that's guaranteed to exist at high energies, at low energies, everywhere you like. Okay. So these are complete theories. These are good theories in the sense of if you want a fundamental theory that describes that you know works up to arbitrarily high energy scales or short distance scales, these types of theories would be in that class. Um, you might wonder whether there's a limit on uh, what delta could be. Delta should be real and greater than some number that's greater than zero. Uh, and for those of you who know about quantum field theory, there's a, there are unitarity bounds, you know, given the uh, we might see this later, but depending on the spin uh, of this field, uh, there's some different number here that depends on the number of dimensions you're in in the spin of the field. Okay, but in particular, delta had be better be greater than zero um, for unitarity reasons. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, I've suppressed indices, as I said. So these could be some. Spinner, tensor, fields. Yes, generally, generally. That's right. So indeed, for example, the Dirac field transforms in some analogous way. OK, let's have some examples then. So the free scalar that we've discussed so so I'm suppressing the Lorentz index there this is a scale invariant oh I'm sorry of course what, what am I doing the, the free scalar firstly I can't have a mass term I should have put a cross through that I'm not allowed a mass term because that will obviously break scale invariance but if it's a massless free scalar that is scale invariant provided my field has its usual uh, dimension. Uh, delta is d minus 2 over 2. Okay? So provided delta is d minus 2 over 2, this action will be invariant under the scale transformation. It's certainly invariant under Poincaré, as you all know, but it's invariant under scale transformation. The reason being that... Uh, under a scale transformation, this will pick up d factors of lambda. The derivatives are inverse, you know, d by dx, so they, pick, they get, will give me 1 over lambda squared. And so I'll require my field to transform with the appropriate numbers of powers of, of lambda to cancel all of that and leave the action invariant. Yep. Yes, that's at the quantum level. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I mean, don't, don't worry about this. That's for people who, uh, well, we, might, we might say more about it later, but uh, it's not important. Here's another example. Classical, uh, say, phi to the four or Yang Mills in four dimensions has a scale invariance. So if I write down a theory like this, let's have some coupling. Let's call it uh, C. I, I normally you call it lambda, but I realize I've used lambda, so I won't. So this thing, uh, again, for the same 
This is now in four, di four space dimensions. For the same delta here, so delta would be one in four dimensions, uh, this is also scale invariant. So this interaction term, remember this is a free theory, the action is quadratic, it's a sort of trivial theory, but this is now an interacting theory. Classically, uh, there's, you know, if you solve the wave equation, the sort of in modes, the modes would all couple together through this nonlinear interaction here. Um, this term is obviously scale invariant because, it, you know, the, the four lambdas you would get by transforming this under the scale transformation are then cancelled by the inverse four you would get from the transformation of phi itself. Um, you may be wondering what this has got to do with Yang-Mills theory, but Yang-Mills theory structurally looks very similar. If I write it out, non-abelian Yang-Mills in terms of the, its vector potential, you know, roughly speaking, you'll get a kinetic term and you'll get some interaction terms, one of which looks like this, and the other one will scale the same way. So it's, this is, uh, so this is, now this is true classically. Now we can wonder, quantum mechanically, are these, you know, it looks like these actions scale as they should. One of the key points that I didn't, uh, I can't remember if I said yesterday, but let me re-emphasize it if I didn't, is that just because an action has a symmetry, classically, doesn't mean when you put it into a path integral and think about your quantum theory, that that quantum theory will still have the symmetry. It's a very subtle business, and it's a very subtle business because in the path integral, you have this horrific integral over all field configurations that you have to do, and to make sense of it, you nearly always have to introduce some way of getting rid of the infinite number of uh, degrees of freedom in the field that you're integrating over. And in particular, if that, when you regulate your theory by, for example, saying I'm only going to integrate over configurations of my field that are, you know, that um, have, a, have a, say, a, a frequency or, or momentum less than a certain amount, if that regulator breaks the symmetry, when you remove it, it's far from clear that your theory will still have a symmetry. It's far from clear your theory will even exist in a nice way, but if it does, it's far from clear it will have the symmetry. And in particular, this scale symmetry is all about scale, and the whole point of introducing these cutoff, the regulator, and then renormalizing the theory by removing the regulator is to kill off very, very short distance behavior that is causing the problems with the path integral in the first place. And so it manifestly breaks this nice scale symmetry that our action may have. And it's then a very subtle question when you remove your regulator whether you recover a theory that's scale invariant. And in fact, in this case, for the, for the free theories, it, it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it all works and it's fine. But in any interacting situation, it's very subtle and these theories are not scale invariant, okay, sort of famously. So Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions is famously not scale invariant. The coupling is dimensionless. That's true, but when you regulate the theory, remove the regulator, renormalize, and so on, you secretly pick up some scale dependence in the coupling. And this is what's called the running coupling. So an example of this, a very physical example is that in our theory of uh, sort of hadronic physics, QCD, the theory of quarks and gluons, um, the coupling in that is, is indeed dimensionless, but as you look at processes at different scales, the effective coupling changes. It's a very subtle effect. So scale symmetry is not something trivial in, you know, at the quantum level, it's not something trivial in the action, it's far more subtle. Um, Nonetheless, this example of n equals four super Yang-Mills, again, looks like some sort of Yang-Mills theory with some scalars and so on. So it, it sort of structurally looks a little bit like this. It's classically scale invariant. That is a theory that is quantum mechanically scale invariant. But it's not a, it's not a triviality that it's, it's by any means that it's uh, scale invariant at the quantum level. Anyway. So, so let me just say, scale invariance 
is often uh, of, of an action is often broken, but not always, uh, by UV uh, regulation uh, and the subsequent renormalization. However, as I said, there are certainly theories that are uh, that retain this scale invariance. And then it's an interesting fact that in all cases we know of, uh, unless there have been very recent developments I'm unaware of, which there may have been, but certainly up to recently, in all cases we know of, when you have a Poincaré invariant theory that is also scale invariant, in fact, you inherit an additional, uh, slightly larger symmetry group, which is the conformal group. So you land up with a conformal group or, uh, or a conformal field theory. So I, to my knowledge, there's no proof of this. Well, there are proofs of it which require some assumptions about the theory. So I think that it's not clear that what the most general proof of this would be, but there aren't sort of relevant examples where you have Poincaré and scale, but not this slightly larger group. And what is the slightly larger group? There's an additional generator of this conformal algebra or conformal group, which is pretty odd and looks like this. It's called the special conformal transformation. I'm not sure why it's special, I should say, but uh, maybe when you see it, you'll see. So again, using the usual Minkowski coordinates, uh, the, it would be generated by a diffeomorphism that looks like this. Okay, so. Okay, so where A is some uh, D vector, so A squared is it contracted with itself and so on. Okay, so it's a rather strange action on Minkowski space. It is, if, you, if you're brave and plug this into the usual Minkowski metric, you can check that it leaves the metric invariant, the form of the metric invariant. And then you can look at its generator, which I won't write down. It's not particularly illuminating. But once you have the generator, you can compute the algebra of its generator, which we'll call K. With the other generators we've written down, and I won't write out It in gory detail, I'll just be schematic. This is the, the usual Minkowski metric, and then there's some other terms. Uh, there's another term with a different index structure. And so there's some commutation relations with the other generators. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be this should be mu. Thank you. But anyway, I mean, I I haven't you know it doesn't really matter uh, the precise form here because I'm going to write it more nice well more nicely uh, in a nicer way. The algebra is actually well the the group is SO2D. And it's not very obvious from the way I've written it down uh, as it's been written down, you know, as we've sort of added generators. But if you repackage everything, it, it takes a much nicer form. So let's introduce uh, indices AB, which are 0, 1, up to D plus 1 where zero to uh, 
d minus 1 were our usual space-time mu nu indices, so we've got two more indices. And then if we write or make the following identifications, then you find that the, uh, these uh, with, I should say, J, so JAB is anti-symmetric. So the other components are determined. So th these are now the generators of this SO2D in a uh, much more familiar form. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I mean I think I mean this. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to check the, uh, the ordering of the signs here. So this looks like the usual rotation generators or uh, Lorentz generators, but just with different numbers of minuses here. So that's why we have uh, SO2D. We've got two minuses in this. Okay. So this is the the group that leaves this invariant. So the conformal group, so if we have Poincaré and scale symmetry, we always land up with a theory that has a larger symmetry group, this conformal group, and it's SO2D. That's the important point. Now, Obviously, when a theory has symmetries, it has consequences, physical consequences. Let's just recap some of the physical consequences of the Poincaré symmetry for vacuum correlators. So we talked about how uh, correlation functions can be uh, computed from this path integral, generating functional for them. Uh, but these are important quantities. Remember, they look like these are examples of correlation functions. They tell you, in some sense, about the behavior of your theory. This, in some sense, tells you what a field is doing at a given point. This object is telling you about how a field propagates from one position in space-time to another. If I have more phi's, for example, that would tell me about how particles in this theory scatter, at least for Poincaré invariant theories. And um, Poincaré invariants already tells us that if we're looking in the, for the field theory in its usual vacuum state and we look at these correlation functions, this must be a constant. It can't depend on space and time. And that, just trivially comes from translation invariance of the vacuum. Okay. And this quantity here, well, whatever it is, it's only a function of the difference in the space-time positions. And in fact, it's only a function, I should say, of the norm of the difference in the space-time positions because of translation invariance and because of Lorentz. Okay. So already, you know, that's quite constraining. But scale invariance now constrains things further. Or rather, well, so for a CFT, not just 
a relativistic field theory where these would be true, it constrains things a little further. This has to vanish. And that's basically because if the field has any scale, and in vacuum, um, this was non-zero but constant, this would have some scale, and it would break scale invariance explicitly. So the vacuum's not allowed to break scale invariance in a scale invariant theory, and so this has to vanish. Note that if the dimension of this was zero, this wouldn't be true, but for reasons of unitarity that we said before, that's not allowed. There's a lower bound. Deltas should be positive. Yep. No, no, uh, no, no, it's uh, under the whole thing. This, this, yeah, the special transformations as well. But uh, at least as of, I'm not quite sure what the state of the art is, but there aren't, I don't know of any examples of theories which are not, which are invariant under scale, but not invariant under this extra symmetry. So, but in fact, uh, some of what we're going to say doesn't depend on, on the whole conformal group. It actually only just depends on, um, on the scale part. Anyway, the form of the two-point function, which is perhaps a little bit more interesting physically, uh, is rather constrained. You can sort of understand intuitively why this, roughly the scale of two phi's is, is uh, um, well, yeah. So this form here, which, you know, you, relativistic symmetry basically just told you it was a function of the norm of x minus y is now entirely constrained to a particular power of that norm. So I should say this is the norm of x minus y to the two delta, where c is some constant, which of course you can set to one by just redefining your field appropriately. And in fact, more generally, if I have, if I have, uh, if you have fields, I'm now gonna put some indices on these, let's say a uh, um, with scale dimension delta A and another field B with scale dimension delta B, the two-point function or rather, let, let me just say uh, for some, I'm being silly, for some A's. Let's assume I've got a few fields and I've labeled them with some index A. It's more sensible. And there's a corresponding scale dimension delta A. Then if I look at the two-point function of two of these things, uh, it's relatively easy to see that it will vanish uh, if the dimensions are not the same. And it will take a form like this if they are the same. So this is nice, uh, so conformal field theory is nice because the propagation of particles is then completely fixed. Well, I should, should be more careful. Because these particles don't have a mass, it's very subtle whether one, one can't really interpret them. Uh, conformal field theory is, if they're interacting, always have very long range interactions and it's rather subtle. The normal manipulations you go through to convert a correlation function like this to a statement about propagation of particles don't really work anymore. But nonetheless, these, these correlators exist and they tell us roughly about how, if you disturb the field in one place, information propagates physically through excitation of the what, whatever it is that, however you want to think about what this field is doing. Um, it's also true that the three-point function uh, is, is constrained up to some constants, so it's functional form, so if I have uh, some fields again like this, A, B, and C, 
I look at the three-point function, which morally speaking, although not for a conformal field theory, but morally speaking in a normal relativistic theory would tell us something about scattering. So this form is fixed uh, in terms of x, y, and z. I won't write it down because it won't be relevant to us. Higher point functions are now not constrained. Uh, they, they're in the sense that they have non-trivial dependence that you don't know a priori on uh, the positions of where the, the fields are living. Uh, so they, they are constrained, but you, they're not constrained enough to know uh, explicitly all of this. Uh, I suppose maybe it's, uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure it is. I don't know if I can give you a deep reason. Maybe think of it like this. If I, th if I think of the correlation function of two, uh, of, uh, two fields in relativistic theory with different spin, and I think of the two-point function. If they've got the same spin, they can have a non-trivial two-point function. If they have different spin, they can't. Why? Well, it's because of the, vac the structure of the vacuum. Well, sorry, they, 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 sorry, I should be more careful. They, they may be able to have a non-trivial correlator, but they may not, depending on the spins. I should be more careful there. But, um, yeah, I'm, so, I, I mean, I, can, I could show you in more detail after how this works, but it's not, you have to, you have to use properties of the vacuum being invariant under dilatations um, and Poincaré. Um, let me see. Lastly, uh, every CFT, well, if we, every quantum field theory, we expect to have a, we expect to be able to take our theory, put it on a curved space. Uh, and in doing so, we can, we can uh, vary the metric and generate a stress tensor in the usual way. That's one way to think about the stress tensor for the theory, which tells us then putting it back, uh, putting the metric back to Minkowski, that will give us our Minkowski stress tensor. And because of this structure, we see that the stress tensor itself must always have dimension D, okay? Because the... The action's obviously dimensionless. There's d uh, x's in the measure. The metric's dimensionless in my conventions here. And so the stress center has to have dimension d. And that's always true. And the stress center can have some non-trivial two-point function, which again takes a similar form. I, I should have said, um, what I should have said here is these, these really are scalar fields as, as I've written things. I've, there are analogous formulae when you have indices, uh, say tensor indices, but now this, will, this object here will be, again, determined by some constant, but will also have some tensor structure, obviously. Let me, let me give you an example of that here. The two-point function of the stress tensor always takes this form, but obviously we've got some index structure which has been suppressed there, which comes out in some object here, which I build from, I won't write it explicitly, it's not terribly illuminating, but I build from these objects which are scale invariant, so the metric and also the combination x mu, x nu over x squared, which is scale invariant, and so, this is a slightly complicated expression in terms of these things, but it's not difficult to write down. And this, this quantity here in a conformal field theory is usually, uh, well, it's, it's, it's often called the effective central charge. It doesn't matter. In two dimensions, it is a central charge for the conformal algebra, but in more than two dimensions, it's 
by analogy it's called this, but you can think of it as counting the degrees of freedom. This is roughly telling us how energy propagates from one place to another, and roughly speaking, the more fields you have around to propagate, the, the, the more energy can propagate. But in particular, let me just, because this may be relevant if we have time later, you can calculate what this is in this theory uh, N equals four super Yang Mills, this example we had before, and it's equal to some number, which in fact is independent of the coupling, interestingly, although that's not usually the case. Um, so it only depends on N, the rank of the gauge group, which indeed counts the number of uh, degrees of freedom in your theory, the number of fields or elementary excitations you could think of, um, but it's some number. Yeah, was there a question? Yeah. Well, I, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Sorry? What is the dependence? Uh, it's, some, it's something like, I'm not sure I can reproduce it on the fly. It's some combination of these objects. Uh, well, no, it's some, uh, I'm not sure, it, it, there's a, this has got various symmetries, it's symmetric in these, it's symmetric in these. This is also a conserved tensor, so one has to build in conservation. So imagine the most general set of terms you could write down using this sort of object and this sort of object that are compatible with uh, a symmetry under these two indices, and the whole thing will be conserved if I act with a derivative of mu or nu or alpha or beta. And there's only one thing of that sort, and I'll leave you to look it up or compute it yourself. It's not very hard, but it's not illuminating. Was there another question? No. Okay. Good. Uh, so, and the last thing then I want to say about conformal field theories, and then you're all experts, or at least uh, you know enough to carry on with what, what we need for ADS-CFT is that in our path integral, remember we wrote down this generating functional for correlation functions, which if I functionally differentiate, it will give me these correlation functions. And schematically, again, there may be many fields. I've just, I'm just calling them all phi. I'm suppressing indices, Lorentz indices. Um, and there may be many, obviously there are many local observables that I could write down. Let me just write one, but you could imagine lots of them. And remember we call, so this is some local functional of the fields. And then this we call a source for whatever operator it is. And then we think of this as a functional of J. And really, because there are lots of different local operators, really this is a function of lots of different j's, one for each local operator I could write down. And then if I functionally differentiate with respect to j appropriately, I, and then set the source to zero, I generate these sort of correlation functions we were talking about. But the only thing I want to say here is that in a conformal field theory, because this will have some dimension, let's call it delta O, the source because the, 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 when I add these sources, the new action with sources should still be scale invariant, otherwise I've explicitly broken scale invariant. The source should also have a transformation under scale um, so that, uh, let's say, the scale dimension of the source, the way it transforms, uh, will be correlated. So it'll go like D minus the dimension of the operator so that this whole thing is scale invariant. Okay. And that will, again, be important later. And then the very last thing I want to say, but I won't, I won't dwell on this, is that I've really talked about a conformal field theory on a flat space-time, on Minkowski space-time, just as with any, just as with a Poincaré invariant relativistic theory on Minkowski, you can then put it on a curved space time, 
but this, if you're on a curved space-time, you've manifestly broken Poincaré invariance, but the action is still constrained by the Poincaré invariance, although there are potentially new terms you can add to your action that will have vanished in Minkowski terms depending on curvatures. Um, in the same sense, you can promote a conformal field theory to a curved space-time, and then um, the theory usually will then have a, 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 a symmetry under vial transformation or scale transformation of the metric, where I change the metric by some So this is a bit, a bit like a scale. If this was a Minkowski, this would look like a scale transformation. But more generally, for any space, I can do a local uh, scale transformation but like this, a vial transformation. And if I, if, I write, if I take my CFT action and covariantize it appropriately, and uh, I can usually ensure that the theory will have some invariance or at least covariance under transformations like this. It won't be. It won't be important for what we have to say, but it's uh, just worth pointing out. OK, so now that's enough. So many of the things that I've written on this board, or these boards, we will see coming up later in very different contexts. So do bear certain things in mind. Uh, these, the form of these two-point functions, for example, just um, just keep this in your mind, okay, that uh, this goes like this. We'll definitely see this within a lecture or so in, in a completely different context, and it'll be very relevant. Yeah? Sorry, should, should the integral there also have the factor i or not? Oh, I see. Sorry, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Good. I mean, of course. <laughs> yeah. So now let's talk about the second part of ADS-CFT, the other bit of jargon, which is ADS. So many of you will know about ADS space-time or have seen aspects of it, so let me, but many of you won't. So it's a peculiar space. Um, I'm going to consider D plus one dimensional ADS. So we were talking about d-dimensional field theory. This will be d plus one-dimensional ADS. Uh, and it embeds as a hyperboloid which I'm going to take to have some radius, let's say L, in a sort of two-timed Minkowski space. I'm not sure what to call it, R2D as so if I take these coordinates on this two time Minkowski space then ADS can be embedded so that the induced metric is the correct ADS metric in the following way as this hypersurface. So just note that whilst the, the ambient space that we're going to embed the metric in has two times, because of the way the embedding works, um, the induced metric will only, well, will be Lorentzian. So note constant xi are time-like uh, closed curves in this embedding. So if I sit at constant x, I can still move essentially around this circle parameterized by u and v. And if I ask what's the proper distance I move, or the proper um, 
displacement, I suppose, I actually move a proper time, right? It's a time-like direction. So I'm moving. I mean, a hyperboloid obviously looks something like this, but I'm not sure I can, uh, I'm not sure I can imagine the two time directions in a, in a nice way. But anyway, the point is you're moving around the hyperboloid, but both the directions you're moving in a time-like. So this is a closed time-like curve. And so ADS is not this embedding alone, it's the covering space of this. Okay, so ADS, it can be embedded as that, but ADS is the, I'll use the word universal cover, but I'm not, I'm not sophisticated enough as a, as a geometer to really know what that means. So if you know what that means, that's great. I, I'll, I'll be more pedestrian. It's the universal cover of the hyperboloid. And as physicists, we can be more explicit. If I parameterize the hyperboloid like this, where these thetas parameterize uh, a d minus one sphere, a unit round d minus one sphere, you can verify that if you plug that into there, using you know, basic trigonometry, that it satisfies the embedding condition and furthermore covers all points on that hyperboloid. And if we were just covering the hyperboloid, tau would be an angle. It would be the angle around this hyperboloid. But because we actually want a space that doesn't have closed time like curves, ADS space time, for ADS space time, uh, we think of tau being a real, not an angle. So as tau goes around, I wind round and round my hyperboloid infinitely many times. And the induced metric, if you now substitute this into here to compute the induced metric, so the metric, uh, and this is a global chart, usually what's called the global chart of ADS, looks like the following. So it's got a simple form. We can also write it in a Schwarzschild-like form, just for where this function f looks like this. So you see the relation between rho and uh, r is just some uh, simple relation like this. And you see that when rho or r is small, it's an origin of uh, spherical coordinates, but when r becomes large, this deviates from flat space, this term becoming dominant over the usual one here that is all I would have in flat space. Okay. Reflecting the asymptotics being different. Now, what are the isometries of this space? The embedding we've used uh, allows us to see the isometries immediately. And they're SO2D. 
Now, obviously, SO2D, the isometries are just, uh, you know, the, the equivalent of the, Poing, uh, of the Lorentz group for this two-time metric is SO2D. I'm not sure what you call it if there are two times, but two, well, anyway, SO2D. And it also, you know, this, it leaves this, this is the inner product of two vectors, if you like, and that's left invariant again by this. So it leaves the embedding invariant, and therefore it, these will be, this is the group of isometries of ADS. It's not manifest, you know, this larger, this group isn't manifest, obviously, in this particular chart, which manifests only some rotations, SO uh, D minus 1 and an SO2, if you like, or, or just translation symmetry in tau. But from this, we can see that there is a larger uh, isometry group hiding. Now, let's try and understand the asymptotics. So as rho, or r equivalently, goes to infinity, this metric is dominated by uh, an exponential blow up of the time and angular pieces like this. So as rho becomes very large, you can see the space is becoming very big in these directions. And rho goes to infinity. Okay, so this becomes obviously arbitrarily large. Now, what, what does that mean? What sort of asymptotics is this? Well, this is a space which is conformally compact. So meaning there's an asymptotic region which can be compactified. In the following sense, so a conformally By the way, the word conformal here is not the same, I mean, in geometry this is called a conformally compact space, but um, it's not really related to conformal transformations, well, directly. There is some relation, but it's a slightly confusing terminology. I mean, or rather, it's a fine terminology, but don't be confused by the uh, competing terminologies, I should say. So a conformally compact space can be written as uh, in the following way. So we have a we have a metric here, a regular metric. a manifold M with boundary that encloses M. And Z is uh, uh, what's called the defining function and so Z is greater than zero inside M and vanishes on the boundary of M uh, linearly. Let's say it vanishes linearly, i.e. dz uh, is not equal to zero on the boundary of M. And such a space, so G is a perfectly regular metric with a real boundary, 
and the full or space time, and the full space time then has an asymptotic region due to this defining function, or one over it, blowing up. Okay. But it blows up in a sort of controlled way. So the full space-time has what's called a conformal boundary. So, um, uh, and uh, it lives, let's say, on M minus its boundary. So the, the boundary now is some asymptotic regime, uh, region. So the full space doesn't have a boundary anymore. You can only think about its asymptotic behavior. We say it's got a conformal boundary, although there's no boundary at all. It's a boundary only in the sense that you can conformally, by multiplying appropriately, you can then turn it into a real boundary of some other metric uh, space space-time. And we say it has a conformal boundary metric um, which is equal to that induced on the boundary of this regular space by this regular metric. Okay, so this regular space has some real boundary with a real induced metric on it, and we say that's the conformal boundary metric of this full space. So really there's no boundary, it's some asymptotic region, but there's some notion of it having a boundary, you know, having some metric that describes that, that, um, that uh, asymptotic region. But... Um, and it, it's not going to be relevant for us, but obviously it's inherent of what I've said. I have a freedom in how I conformally compactify a space-time that has a conformal boundary. If you give me one positive smooth function on this space and recover a new defining function with a, you know, with a different regular metric, so this whole... Uh, construction is only defined up to multiplying this defining function by some positive, now strictly positive, uh, function. And therefore, the conformal boundary metric is defined only up to um, a vial transform. So again, it won't, won't play much role in what we're going to do, but uh, it's just worth noting. And now we can see, let me see, I started at 2.15, right? So 10 minutes. Now we can see what this is. Okay, this is a conformal boundary. This is a conformally compact space. And the conformal boundary metric, at least a representative for it, i.e. it's only defined up to vial transformations, so we talk about conformal classes of the boundary metric, as in the, the equivalent elements within the class being generated by vial transformations. So this thing, uh, the, the conformal um, boundary metric of this is actually just, or a representative of this, is just this. It's just minus d tau squared plus d omega squared. So, let me do that more explicitly. In fact, where did it go? So, for ADS over there, if we take E to the row e to the rho equals 1 over z, then asymptotically, just asymptotically, we could 
we see the metric tends to this form, and this uh, I can write as 1 over, let's call it this big Z squared. This is our defining function. It certainly goes to 0 in a nice, uh, this is a regular metric. I can say, take Z to be from 0 to infinity. And then, or in fact, I don't need, sorry, I don't even need to, to uh, so I, I, I'm only doing a, an analysis locally anyway, but uh, Z has a boundary at zero is what I want to say, and extends some to some positive value here. This defining function indeed goes to zero at the boundary and is positive away from it. So this is a conformal boundary. And so the conformal boundary metric let me write it as the, the boundary of, let's call it this here, this space M, and write it as the boundary of M, even though it's not a boundary, it's a conformal boundary. Let me just write it like that. Uh, so this is what people would usually call the Einstein static universe, but it's basically just you know, time across a sphere, a round sphere. So that's the boundary of this uh, ADS space-time. And we can then draw a nice picture of it. Where in our picture we've conformally compactified it, so we're sort of drawing a picture of it in uh, this conformally compactified sense. We should think of it as an infinite cylinder, solid cylinder, where um, The boundary of this cylinder, so the ADS space is the interior, the boundary of this cylinder, if you like, in this regular space, is, the, is what will give you the conformal boundary of the full space time. So this is the conformal boundary. It's not a real boundary. Remember, it's an asymptotic region. And uh, the ADS space time lives in the interior. And our tau coordinate goes up, and our angular coordinates go around, and if you like, our radial coordinate, there's a, a, as we've drawn it, there's a sort of center of spherical symmetry, and then our radial coordinate goes out and reaches infinity at this conformal boundary, it tends to infinity there. And one of the key points that's very easy uh, I mean, it's a simple calculation. One of the key points about ADS is that whilst this is an asymptotic region, this conformal boundary is uh, time-like. The Lorentzian manifold. And in particular, one can ask, supposing I send a null ray in my space, out towards the boundary, does it reach it? And in fact, as I've drawn things, um, this isn't really a conformal diagram, I mean, it's not a Penrose diagram, but sort of morally speaking, light rays would travel at 45 degrees in this diagram. So in particular, light rays really do reach the boundary if I emit them from anywhere in the interior with my flashlight. They travel out and they meet, they, they hit the boundary at a finite time tau and that's a key, key physical point about ADS space. It's actually not true if you take a space-like curve and take it out to the boundary. It's an infinite proper distance. Very easy to see that. But a null, a null geodesic travels out to the boundary and hits it in a finite time tau. The key physical point there is that ADS acts like a box like a real physical box. So even though this isn't a real boundary, it's a conformal boundary, it's not some asymptotic region, actually for null rays, they really get to the boundary in a finite proper time for observers in the interior. So imagine someone sitting arbitrarily far out, you know, in a finite time in the interior, you could send a message arbitrarily far out, and get your friend to send it back to you and you'll reach, you know, you'll recover it in a finite proper time. 
So what that means physically is if I want to define dynamics in this space, I must in impose some sort of boundary conditions out here. You know, all my fields, all my dynamics, are high energy modes, short distance uh, wave mode, or you know, high frequency wave modes, will propagate out to the boundary, and I'll have to deal with the boundary when I deal with dynamics. I can't ignore it. And in, in some sense, I will expect stuff to go out, and with appropriate boundary conditions, it may come back at me. Okay, so it really acts like a box. Yeah, there's a couple of questions, yeah. Uh, so if I've, if I've got a, a, a time-like curve here, could be a geodesic. Oh, this, this is some null ray. I just mean it will reach the boundary at some, uh, in the conformal boundary, at some finite tau. And then, it will, if you like, it will go, what do I mean? Or, sorry, what, what, how do I answer the question, shall I say? So I, th I, I think it is a, I, I actually can't remember if it's a finite affine time along the curve. You can, you can do the calculation and tell me. But it's not the important point. Um, and I think it's not a finite affine time along, uh, it's, not a, it's not a finite affine parameter along the curve. And for the physicists, that's because the affine parameter basically tells you about the blue shift or red shift of a, a photon, if you like, which becomes infinite. So it isn't a finite affine parameter, but nonetheless, uh, it will reach in a finite time tau, and therefore someone arbitrarily far away can catch this before it escapes and send it back, and for me, in a finite time tau, I will then see that, uh, see some information return. Sorry, was there another question? Okay. Yeah, question. Oh, yeah. Maybe I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure what you mean. It's not a physical boundary, no, it's an asymptotic region. It's an infinite proper distance spatially. So if I, if I send a spatial curve out, I mean, you can just uh, you know, do, the, do the calculation for, for the metric I gave you. If, you. if you look at a curve that's uh, on a constant time slice and ask how long is it, it's got a proper, uh, an infinite proper distance length to, the, to infinity. So it's, it's really not a, not, a, not a boundary in the usual sense of boundary, but the important point is it is a boundary for null rays. Um, let me just finally, in the one, last one minute, write down another uh, chart which we will be using, really, or this is the way we'll think about ADS, and it's the Poincaré chart. And in terms of this embedding, if I did everything right, but you can go away and check. There's a rather complicated way of parameterizing not all of the hyperboloid, but half of it, using a different parameterization than we had before. So this is, uh, only covers half the hyperboloid. And what half is it, or, or well, or rather, um, there's, a, there's a complicated map. When you think about what portion of this space you're covering, so you only cover half of the hyperboloid, but remember ADS is the cover of the hyperboloid, so what bit of this solid cylinder are we covering? And basically we're taking a null wedges, I think this is the way to think about it, you take null, a null wedge that uh, intersects the boundary, or, or, or slices through this 
uh, cylinder and then take another null wedge that just intersects the boundary here at the same point. And basically the interior of this wedge is what's covered by this. And so if, if we thought about a conformal diagram for what these, uh, what we're covering, really there's a boundary or a conformal boundary. And then we've got some Cauchy uh, horizons. here and here, associated to the, these null surfaces. But the induced metric now takes a very simple form. And just to be clear here, A ran from one up to D minus one, and now you know, mu is our usual zero, one up to D minus one. Okay, so this is the metric of ADS in this Poincaré chart. It doesn't cover, it's not geodesically complete. Obviously, I can extend it through these uh, Cauchy horizons. But note, uh, I'll say this again next time, this manifests some interesting isometries uh, in particular, there's a Poincaré-like isometry, uh, which is the usual one uh, associated to these coordinates. This is the Minkowski metric, so clearly if I do a Poincaré transformation on these x's, I generate uh, an isometry of this metric. And there's also an interesting, uh, an interesting one here where I scale my z coordinate and the x's in the same way. Okay, and that's obviously also an isometry. It leaves this metric invariant. But think about the conformal boundary now. Z is a, a defining function in its own right now. What's the conformal boundary? It's that z is zero. It's just the Minkowski metric. And these isometries, therefore, have an action on the conformal boundary. And what's the action on the conformal boundary? It's Poincaré and scale. And in fact, whilst this doesn't manifest this special conformal transformation, that's also there. It's just not manifest in these coordinates. It's a more complicated isometry. Or, you know, in these coordinates, there's something nasty. Okay. So, as we'll say, next, you know, as I'll just reemphasize at the beginning of next time, we see that the isometries of ADS have an action on the boundary that looks like it's the conformal group action. Okay, so, sorry, I've ran over.